school. to sufficient bandwidth could be focusing on as, as an opportunity for especially our young people in terms of potential careers. So with no further ado, John, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Take guys. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me up here. I, I'm going to keep this really informal because um, honestly, the presentation I did last night was something I've done probably 50 times. But this is really a new, this is like a new territory for me of just discussing it. So um, just a little bit about where I came from. I grew up in upstate New York um, and I spent a lot of time in Vermont. So I, I do have a connection to the rural landscape and I feel right at home here. And I think that's why I was kind of drawn back here. Um, I know this is the second time, but there's, uh, there's always something about when you live in a city and you're commuting back and forth all day, that you kind of wish to come back to a place like this a lot. And it's like this like fantasy that sits out there. Um, and I think there's something about that that, I mean, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but that's there's something there you can really capitalize on. Um, but, so yeah, I, I grew up um, doing a lot of drawing and art and music, and then I went to art school in Halifax, Nova Scotia, at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Um, I, I did a year at Pratt, but that urban environment wasn't really for me. Uh, and 
that, you know, it's a small art school, really sharp um, faculty, uh, only about 500 students, but, um, and um, I got a really great education there, and that's where I met all of my Canadian friends. Um, and then I, eventually I went back to Blue Sky, which they became, um, they, they got bought by Fox eventually, and they did the, the Ice Age films. So I was doing commercial work with them, really, you know, learning how to be a professional in the world of animation. And then um, when Toy Story came out, that was in 1995, that was kind of like a watershed year for the whole industry because when I was growing up, Tron, that was the thing for me. Like, I thought that was cool. And I was, all my hand-drawn animations were of like rotating blocks and cylinders and stuff. <laughs> I was already doing computer animation, but in, in flip books and the sides of bad romance novels and stuff. So um, I, I was kind of at the, at the forefront of it in the sense that I was doing something that no one else was doing. Um, and there were only a handful of people in the world that were teaching it or learning it. That was in like 89, 90. But as, as Pixar was doing their short films, I was watching them very closely. Um, I was fascinated with that whole thing. And then, then when they did Toy Story, that was kind of like everything changed because that was 95, um, first and you know computer animated feature film and Jurassic Park they both came out at the same time so Jurassic Park was one end of the spectrum where that was that just kind of blew up blew wide open the whole effects industry and what was possible it was a photoreal monster that they made that you couldn't tell whether it was the puppet the animatronic or the the CG animated figure and you totally believed that thing was alive and then Toy Story, which is this charming feature film that was completely done in CG. And I think that really caught everybody off guard. Um, and that was really when the industry just took off. And, um, and I feel like I've been riding that wave ever since. Um, so in 97, I went out to Pixar and I stayed there for 10 years. I worked on A Bug's Life, Toy Story 2, Monsters, Inc., Incredibles, Ratatouille, and Cars. And then um, I had to relocate to LA for totally non-work related reasons and they were about to, they just had done the Disney deal there where Pixar, the management of Pixar basically took over the film division, the animation division at Disney. Um, John Lasseter and Ed Catmull and I thought well this isn't the best studio right now but it will be um, and I was right and I I was the animation supervisor on Tangled, uh, and then I did a little work on Bolt and on Frozen, and then I did Paper Man, and that won the Academy Award, and then I decided to go out and try to, you know, pursue directing outside of the studio, and that's when I went to Paramount, so that's why I'm now in Hollywood, literally, I'm in Hollywood. <laughs> the, the Hollywood sign is like as visible when I walk out of the office as it is as that ridge line out there. <laughs> it's just right up on the hill and, and the studio is Paramount and um, Paramount is the last great flagship studio that's in Hollywood. All the other studios have been, um, they've either gone over the hill into the valley or they've just kind of become this kind of fragmented thing that isn't really a studio anymore. Um, and there's, for, for Hollywood studios that have like a back lot, you know, they have all the sound stages and all the facilities and they have those like New York City streets and stuff. Um, Paramount is really cool because it has all that stuff and there's a romance to that, this filmmaking, it's, it's just a cool place to be. And they know how to work that and I think um, this is this is like the image that Hollywood wants you to that wants you to believe right now, and this is actually my um, my agency. This the, their lobby and their conference room is just like intimidating, clean, white, uh, imposing, and um, and this is the Hollywood backlot of uh, Paramount. 
And um, this is like where George Costanza fought for the parking spot on um, Seinfeld, <laughs> you know. Um, and this, this is these are streets and places that have been used hundreds and hundreds of times in all these different movies. And um, you know, I think the outer exterior of what the film, the filmmaking industry they would like you to believe that it's this kind of glitzy and glamorous thing. In fact, that glitz and glamour really reached its peak in the, the great studio age of like the 30s and 40s and even 50s. Um, and there's, they still want to project that image, but I gotta tell you, this is where I work every day. <laughs> <laughs> this is a double wide on the Paramount lot next to uh, the gas pumps in, the, in like the northeast corner. Is this because they know you're from upstate? <laughs> <laughs> Want me to just feel at home? <laughs> the Vermonter in me. Um, yeah. And um, I guess this is the point I'm trying to make right now is that um, Hollywood, in general, the, the town of Los Angeles isn't really making films there anymore. They're creating films. They've become, they have now shifted to become the idea generation plant for for films, but they're, the whole idea of where it, what it is to make a film and where it's done has totally been transformed over the last, particularly over the last like 10 or 20 years where they don't really use their own sound stages anymore. Um, they, they do tend to shoot around town, especially downtown, because downtown's become revitalized and I think there's maybe some kind of incentives going on, but um, for the most part, what goes on there is writing and creating and deals are being made and things, plans are being made to do this, but um, honestly, Vancouver has become Hollywood North uh, because the tax credits have been, they're so compelling that it's basically half price. Um, and half price, if I was in business, I would want to get my product for half price. So. Um, if you look at, and I've, I visited a, one of the biggest um, um, kind of like flagship releases that's coming out, I think next, next year, it's called Tomorrowland, it's directed by Brad Bird. Um, Brad directed um, The Incredibles and Ratatouille and Mission Impossible 4 and he's doing this huge film for, um, for Disney right now called Tomorrowland. And, every crane in that city was on that set and it was like a amusement park scale thing full of blue screens and multiple camera setups all over the place and I mean that city is incredibly well equipped to handle any production of any size now there is no they are not kidding around and you can basically do anything you want and Paramount's shooting another film right there um, they're just finishing up with with a friend of mine who I used to work for. And um, so there's there's a ton of activity happening in these kind of far-flung places, but Vancouver works really well because it's in the same time zone, it's only a couple hours away, um, they have the same language, it looks like North America for a North American look and feel, if that's what your content is. So um, that makes a lot of sense, but you know, honestly what's going on in our world is this. We're just sitting around in our double wide on these dumpy couches with no cards. <laughs> and um, and that's, this is the process of building stories that you, um, you're pinning up no cards and raw ideas of beats of the film. And that's, this is just me and the writer um, trying to figure out what's act one, what's act two, what are the act two complications, what's the midpoint and what's the climax of the film, and what's the theme of it, all these things, all, this is story. This is something I'm still learning and figuring out, and it's always very difficult. It's difficult for the people that have been doing it for years, and it's, it, that's why Hollywood movies are always, I think, or any movie, any movie and any story is like, it's hard to crack that, um, of what it is that makes story work and what makes a film entertaining and enthralling. Um, and I mean, this was just last week, this is about as formal as it gets. This was our, a story review that we had, and we actually put like cookies out uh, in our double <laughs> 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 And um, so, 
I guess the point I'm making is that that's the kind of work that can happen anywhere. There's that's there's nothing special about Los Angeles or Hollywood. I mean, if I was to strip away, I was trying to just strip away all of that facade of what filmmaking is. Um, you don't need much, you know. Um, like any artist doesn't really need much to create their art, and um, so. This, I've never done this talk before. I'm making it up as I go. So, um, <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah. yeah. Really good job. Um, thanks. Um, so this place might look a little familiar to you, but it's not Caslo. Uh, it reminds me a lot of Caslo, though. This is um, Annecy, France. It's very close to the Swiss border. Um, and this is a place that carries a lot of romance with it, and it has one of the biggest animation festivals in the world. Um, the Annecy International Film Festival. This is where we premiered Paper Man. Um, it's, it's got these canals that run through it. It's situated on this incredible lake. And um, it's very close to Geneva. And um, this is a place that I think has a resonance for you guys, even though I wouldn't try to become Annecy. There's no way that would happen because it's, this is such a much larger just physically a much larger place um, in terms of the town. It's and 30 or, 30 or 40,000. Oh, it must be at least that much. But um, it's interesting just coming here and setting, settling into the hotel, which is pretty first class, I think, um, by the way. The little things that when I, like when I go to France and I check into a hotel in Annecy, I'm like, okay, I have a currency issue. I have to get money. I have to, my phone, I know it's going to be like $300 a day extra because I have to like, do the international thing and, um, but those little things like when you check into the Castle Hotel, um, the Wi-Fi is just all there, there's no password, you just go. I, don't, I can't tell you how happy that makes me. <laughs> just because I've traveled around, I've done these, I did a whole bunch of these festivals, and you're just like, I need to communicate. And I think this is the, the crux issue here of like the, the, broad, the idea of broadband and communicating in general. If you can't communicate, then you're really, you really have a problem. And um, so, I, by the way, this, this kind of stuff. A lot of the artists that I'm using, some of, some, one of them is in Seattle, one of them is in Scotland, one of them is in Northern California, and two or three of them are in Los Angeles. So <clears throat> our, you can also see there's a kind of fragmenting of where we are physically and how it really has become, um, it's not an impediment to working. It's nicer to have people there with you. Like it's nicer that I'm here instead of, um, I, FaceTime connection um, because we can hang out face to face and I think that counts for a lot and I think there's times where you just have to be together but I mean there's one guy who is in Northern California who um, he he has a number two pencil and like copy paper and this is like his bread and butter that's what he works on it's so simple and then he just scans these things and sends them down to us and that's that's all he really needs as an artist. Um, he doesn't need anything fancier than that. But, Apparently, um, you need an eraser as well. <laughs> he doesn't erase that much. No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's good. Um, so, I, I guess putting this presentation together, um, my my first thought was, of course, Annecy, because Annecy. You know, why is that such an why is it such a successful animation festival? And um, the reason is partly because it is in this loca lo exotic location, and people want to get out of their normal day-to-day -day world and go to these places. I think um, Telluride is very similar. Uh, Sundance, um, these are places that were started probably by a one person or a small group of people, just like the Castle Jazz Fest. I think it was just started by one guy, right? <coughs> and usually I think if there's I think if there's just the determination of one or a couple people to make something that wasn't there before, people are going to get inspired to follow and, and make that thing happen. Um, and it seems entirely possible that something that fits your town 
um, could certainly happen. Um, in terms of Canada, this is your real only competition. Um, I can't really think of any other significant animated film festival if you were to try to do something like this. Um, and I've been to it, it's pretty good. It's, it's, it's really the only game in town in Canada from what I, from what I know. Um, they, they claim on their website it's the largest in North America. It might be because, and this is the other point I wanted to make, is that the, this is the LA Film Festival. When you go to the LA Film Festival, this is what you get. Brightly colored, like, crappy bars, and like, there's no one there. Like, there's nothing happening. And the reason that there's nothing happening there is because that's where everyone works. They're all slogging through their day-to-day -day world. And they don't want to go to the place that they are to see more of what they do. I mean, they, when I go to Annecy, it's like, it's, it's interesting, I don't actually see that much animation. I don't want to sit in a theater looking at like, you know, hours and hours and hours of animation. I want to go to this exotic place that's beautiful in this beautiful lake and surrounded by nature and there's something exotic and romantic about going to these far-flung places, far-flung places. And, um, and Annecy has that. And Ottawa kind of has that, but you have that in spades here. So, um, I mean, that certainly must be the draw for the, the jazz festival. Um, like Telluride in particular, for me, is interesting because it's so, it's become such an elite kind of creme de la creme of film festivals, and it's really, really hard to get there. And I think that's almost kind of the point, is that it's, there's a, you have to work to get there and you feel like you made a special journey. You went out of your way, you kicked yourself out of the normal cycle of your daily life and you went to this place that felt exotic and romantic. And um, so that's, that's my quick thing about the film festival thing. I'm, I have another a few ideas about what animation's presence could be. Um, one of them is a, having to do with schools um, and how, it, un, under the right conditions, um, really special things can happen in these really um, remote places. And again, I think Black Mountain College is one of these places. This is in, um, it's in the woods of North Carolina. I don't even, it's not even there anymore. It didn't last very long, but when it was up and running, it was this mecca like Albert Einstein gave a lecture there, and uh, John Cage was there, Buckminster Fuller had a huge presence there. Um, Merce Cunningham, the choreographer, Kenneth Nelson was one of, another guy who was kind of like a Buckminster Fuller kind of guy. Um, the poets Ed, Ed Dorn and Robert Creel or something? Yeah, they're just, uh, it's unbelievable, like, it was like a nexus of, of great art and culture and, um, architecture and philosophy and science all converging for a short time in this one really weird, how the hell did that happen in this place? I don't get it. But I think it has to do with um, if the right person and the right can invite the, the current kind of critical mass of people, um, you're going to get something to happen. Um, I think Halifax, for me, was really the first place I thought it's strange that, like, how, how was it that this place was such a, um, a mecca for conceptual art in the 1970s? Why did Joseph Boys and Klaus Oldenburg, Vito Acconci, why did, that, why did that happen? I don't even know what the circumstances are, but it did, and it made that school, it shifted the whole dynamic of what that school was all about. And for a school of only 500 students, it's almost better that it was smaller in a way, that it was the compact, little place where people were thinking and meeting in this faraway place. Um, it felt like what those, the, the way that that school was emerging was something that couldn't happen in a big city. Um, and I found that whole thing fascinating. And NASCAR had happened because of the, you know, the vision of one person. Again, it just takes one person's vision to really make these things come out into the world. And then there's another place um, 
that I find really fascinating. I don't know, have you guys ever heard of this place, Marfa? No. This has become like, I, I think what happened was, um, I'll just jump ahead, is this guy, Donald Judd, who was a minimalist sculpture, he moved there in 71. And this is, this is in West Texas. There is nothing there. <laughs> I mean, and I think maybe that's, that's, the, that's the attraction, is just, there is nothing there, and it's this emptiness and, and open environment where you can just be free to think whatever you want and just relax and get away from it. It's the, it's the antithesis of an urban environment, and I think that's part of the draw, but there's a hotel there now called the Hotel Cosmico, and it's a bunch of like hipster trailers, like um, camper trailers. And you cannot get in there like six months in advance. It's booked solid. But there's nothing, there's like a thousand people there. I don't get it. So, but I still want to go there because there's something like captivating about this place that is just empty. And, and I, think, I think people, artists need that. Their souls need to feel that open freedom for once in a while. Um, and I think this place, Castle, could could have that kind of effect on people. I think it does have that kind of effect on people. Um, I put Robert Frost up here again because this is a guy that he kind of went into the woods. Like he lived, uh, he's an artist that created what he did totally in isolation. A lot of it in Vermont and um, New Hampshire. And I think of this place, Caslow has a capability has potential as a retreat kind of place as well. Um, and then one of the other things that I, my gut response when I was talking with Randy about what Caslow meant and um, what it was capable of in terms of drawing art and animation to it. Um, I mean, Stanley Kubrick is one of my favorite directors and basically after Spartacus, he, he just like checked out of Hollywood. He never flew again, because um, I think he didn't like to fly. And he moved to the UK and he settled in this like estate. And he just stayed there for the rest of his life. He never left. But he made all of those seminal films for the next 20 or 30 years from that. He basically made his own production facility that that place where the note cards are, the double wide, that was like, this is his version of that. And um, um, I think there's a lot to be said for, once this guy figured out how to make films, he didn't need Hollywood to make those films. He made them totally outside of that environment and he staked his own claim in his own way. And honestly, getting away from that place where everyone is looking at themselves and thinking the same thing and copying themselves. You need to get out of those places to break your rhythm and get those original ideas back again. Um, so that's, it's a really com, you know, compressed presentation, but um, it's amazing how similar that photograph is to Annecy. But um, there is something really magical about this place that I am drawn to and I think um, like I was saying before, when I'm stuck in my car on the 110 freeway, I do as much work as I can listening to music and thinking about the stories that I'm trying to tell and trying to work those things out. But the bottom line is I'm really still stuck on the freeway. And I think about Caslow a lot and coming back here um, because there's a, there's a magical quality to this place that I think you guys can really use to your advantage. And I, I think you're already doing that. Um, the only other um, thing I was also thinking about this morning is perhaps an artist in residence program or um, just in general of what the NFB was doing in the 80s and with kind of handing the filmmaker the financial wherewithal to do something but doing it in a place like this I think it'd be a really great idea where you could put somebody up through the winter and force them to just 
hunker down and animate. <laughs> uh, it doesn't take much these days. I mean, it used to just be you just need an animation disk and paper, and you can start working. And for a 2D animator, somebody like Richard Bach, who did the Mango Planet Trees, it, he just did all that whole thing with colored pencils, and it's one of the greatest animations that's ever been done. Um, and again, that happened totally outside of the studio system. But for a computer animator, I don't think, I think the technology is, it really has trickled down tremendously. Um, and like the, the cutting edge equipment that was used to do like the Matrix or something is, is the junk of yesterday now. And this, the capability of this is now far exceeds all that um, horsepower that they used to make those movies. So to get like a Maya license and a little bit of technology in to create that kind of artwork really doesn't take much um, compared to what it used to be. Uh, the, le the playing field has become so much more level. In and, and you see this in the schools in particular that um, what the students are doing and the, the polish and the finesse and the professional quality of, the, of what the product is that they're creating for say CalArts or Sheridan or Vancouver Film School, um, it just not blows my doors off what they're capable of and the, the quality and that's that's just because the tools have just there's been such a push to refine them and make them so much more usable um, and again that's 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 stuff that can happen anywhere and I I think it could easily happen here um, so I, I I figured we'd probably just talk about this more if you guys wanted to do a QA. and a yeah terrific um, so there are some words from August kind of scattered the, ideas. The, the, first, the first executive director of the Caslo International Alpine Animation Summit. Witnesses. Okay, so just just to kick it off, I mean, John has kindly been focusing his comments on this place, and a few of you in the room know that that we. And when I say we, I mean the Castle Institute are very interested in, in, in part, uh, helping uh, Caslo redefine its place in the economic world by looking at animation and uh, casting a larger net, um, affiliated creative arts, including writing and music, and obviously new and emerging digital technologies to create a new kind of economic platform for folks who live not simply in Caslo, but, but we're looking further afield. We already have conversations going on with our friends in Nelson, our friends in Roslyn, in New Denver. Um, and what I find it in part intriguing about the opportunities for not just those of us who live in this region, with Caslo, it's at the center, of course. Uh, but British Columbia, writ large, is that we do have now this this rapidly emerging sort of center in Vancouver, which is kind of now our version of what Los Angeles used to be. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're constantly the 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 cluster of industries there that are focused on animation and special effects constantly scrambling for people, for talent. And there, there's a real opportunity, I think, to reach out to not only post-secondary institutions in Vancouver, as well as elsewhere in North America, but also the industry itself. And to, you know, sometimes you need to wrap things up to get someone to actually open the present and see what's inside, and that's, mm -hmm. that's in part the role that I see something like an International Animation Summit play to, to really excite the interests <coughs> of people like John who are established in the industry who might not only be interested in coming here for a visit and a chance to unwind and relax and, and talk face to face and dream and scheme with other people in the industry from elsewhere in the world, but also to help make some of what we want to make happen both because it's exciting, it's an adventure, it's something to think about when you're stuck on the freeway in LA, and it's 110 Fahrenheit mm -hmm. outside. You can't see downtown because <laughs> there is still smog. Uh, but also because it's, it's potentially good for the industry. 
and good for the world, as Corky Evans said earlier this morning. The world increasingly is becoming urbanized, and ironically enough, the more urbanized it becomes, the more it needs places like the places we're all from. So, questions, comments, ideas, fire away. Here. John, I have a question about, um, sort of in a sense, overall economics. I mean, it's like Hollywood and LA is the, is the film hub. If you want to sell something, you go down there. If you want to sell a book, you go to New York. Or you go to Toronto. And Can you speak something. just a little bit louder, please? How, how about the, the basic core economics that you, you know, if you're going to sell a film, you go to Hollywood. If you go to, you want to sell a book, you go to Toronto or New York. I mean, how much does that affect, like Kubrick made it and then the left was able to carry that with him? How do yeah, you build those connections up here? Um, well, from issue. what I've seen, I haven't, I haven't really been exposed to that end of it that much, but I'm seeing more and more of it just in the last year that I've, the people that I, I'm not like a worker bee at a desk doing shots anymore. I'm now in the mix of writers and directors and studio executives more and more, and I'm, I'm seeing that there is definitely that game to it. Um, and I think that is something that you really do have to be there for um, physically because the pitch and the the schmoozingness of it that's definitely there's a currency to that that's that's very highly valued um, and there's a there's a new show called Silicon Valley I don't know if you've out there, if you've seen yeah. that pilot episode when when they realize he has something that's worth something and the, the way that game is suddenly played, I mean, it's it's the Silicon Valley version of it, of what happens in Hollywood, but I've never seen that phenomena so wonderfully like caricatured and shown um, when as soon as one person thinks that that person is worth something, there's like a pile on that happens and they, they use that as like a currency um, from one party to another and play them against each other. That's definitely that that happens. I'm not really that interested in it myself, but Tom Middleditch in that is from Nelson. Oh, really? Yeah. Which is the main Lord. actor, or yeah, and one of the core writers. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I graduated from LBR and interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, his brother's teaching drama. Jake is still there. He's oh, my yeah. neighbor. He's my factory. Huh. And I worked with Tom. He played uh, Lucky in my. I directed Waiting for Godot when he was, oh, okay. when he was still in high school. So yeah, I, um, well, I, that's that's not, that whole side of it is not something that I want to dwell on and I don't think it's, it's not really relevant for a place like that, for, for like for a place like this. I, I think you're right with the Kubrick example. He made his impact and now he had his chips that he could play and he could play them from anywhere in the world. Um, but to make inroads, I think it, there is a, a premium placed on being there in LA to do that. And um, like, if, if you're a writer, you should have three scripts, and you should be in LA trying to sell those scripts. And to try to do it any other way right now doesn't really make much sense. But um, but I mean, my what I'm drawn to for what could happen in a place like this is more on the side of like having a festival or a workshop or um, I think you know leading a workshop would be my own personal like preference where you do like a six week or a ten week or a two week or a ten day whatever um, find a facility to do that and draw people to it in a small way first and then See where that leads. Um, there's you're always a part of the executive that, director, right? There's no problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I just made a command decision. Um, that personally, I've always had a, I've always felt a draw to go back to academia in one way or another, to to start an animation program somewhere. Um, um, right now, that would not happen, but maybe in, maybe in the future it could. But I mean, I could see that someone doing that for sure. In, in a place like this. Yeah. Okay, right here. okay other, other questions, comments? Kevin? Yeah. If, if there were to be a facility in a place like Caslo, what infrastructure would need to be in place to host a workshop, like you mentioned? Um, well, you definitely need the machines. 
uh, if you're doing computer animation. Um, and you probably need uh, what are called Cintiqs, which are Wacom. They're made by Wacom, although there's, a, there's more competition for these kinds of things now, finally, thank God. But for a while, the Wacom tablet that was called a Cintiq has a pressure-sensitive pen. Mm -hmm. That, coupled with Photoshop, is the way that you make your storyboards and ultimately is a, a huge component in the way you create the content. So the industry standard is Photoshop, a Cintiq tablet, and a Maya seat, which is Maya. Um, for a while, Canadians had the lock on animation software with soft image and mm -hmm. um, waveform, wave, wavefront, was it? That was all years ago. Um, and that, maybe you could add in like a, um, an editorial suite as well. And once you get into the, that kind of bandwidth where you're, you're throwing around files for editorial, then the standards for the data transfer suddenly go way up because it's just so much more stuff to move around. And so are you talking like 100 megabit per second connection? Or? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what you guys have here. Oh, right now we're just laying out 100 megabit per second and there's, there's a prospect of a, giga, a gigabyte uh, connection. In, in Caslow, uh, it's at a cost of about 150 grand to bring the fiber in. So the yeah, it would be fiber then, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot. Of, I mean, Google's doing some stuff with fiber now, and it's 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 like what do they call that? Disruptive technology. Yeah. Because in down in places like Texas, it's definitely changing the game and the monopoly that the broadband suppliers have traditionally had and. I can see because of the, I can see that as like almost like electric cars where it's happening in very small places, but now it's going to become more prevalent and the costs are going to come down. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't really get too caught up on the technology anymore because I'm too old to learn. <laughs> I feel like I've, I've learned like a whole bunch of software packages already and now I'm like, enough, I know Photoshop, it's enough. Um, We're with you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Molly? So we do have a lot of talented kids in our communities, our rural communities, and, mm -hmm. but the idea of having to, you know, and we're also trying to encourage them to stay in our community, so there Animation is a huge field for kids. I mean, they have yeah. video games and all that stuff. So, can you suggest any kind of online thing that they could be using rather than having to go to Vancouver or places like that? that uh, well, work? there is Animation Mentor, which is started by actually some from some friends of mine at Pixar started it, um, and I think it's still going. It was it was kind of peaking a few years ago, and I'm I'm assuming that it's still going. But what it is is. <coughs> Um, I mean, it'd be perfect for you guys because it's a totally decentralized <laughs> school where the mentors are all over the world and the students are all over the world and they'll pair up a student with a mentor and then they have a very set curriculum and the files just get transferred back and forth and they get like a very mannered review process and sometimes it's opened out to more than one mentor um, or, or sometimes it's just the mentor working with them one on one, but that mentoring kind of situation really is, I think, the best for teaching animation. Mm -hmm. um, you can get something out of being in a class environment, but having that one on one instruction is really ideal. That's why that school, I think, has really taken off. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap, but um, I think the kids that come out of there, the, the the, the reels that they make, the, you know, the show reel that they put together, to they put it online now. They don't even, nobody uses tape or sends mm -hmm. a disc anywhere anymore. But, <coughs> um, they're a little bit like, they have a, they, you can see the standard curriculum in the content of the work, so I think the challenge is to get the kids to break out of the, the, the kind of railroad lines of, of what the curriculum is teaching them. But I would say they're pretty well prepared to like make their first dip into the industry when, by the time they get through that. 
What, what's it called? It's called Animation Mentor. Animation Mentor. And what would the cost be for something like that? Oh, I think it's like 14 grand. Don't quote me on that. It's 14 grand per year or something like that. Um, and I think it's a two or three year program. And it's very focused on just animation. So in that sense, it's kind of like a vocational school. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you go to a real art school, you're going to get a much more complete um, education of all art, of composition and design, color theory, drawing, painting, all of the equipment that you need as an artist. That's the thing. I, I mean, I when I got out of art school, I felt like I had a really powerful set of tools to apply to anything I was going to be asked to do, whether it was like design a window treatment, like a window dressing for a window display for a JC Penney, or whether it was like make a poster for an event, or to animate something, or to draw someone's portrait, or to design lettering, um, like all of those things I could bring to bear on any given problem. And it, I think it's because that like NASCAD and a lot of those schools are really interdisciplinary and they teach you, it's like when you get um, a liberal arts degree, it's like, well, I didn't really learn anything, but you learned everything. You learned all about <laughs> art and literature and what it is to tell stories and write. And um, it doesn't seem practical sometimes, but actually it is really practical in ways that you just can't measure or difficult to measure. But yeah, I would say Animation Mentor is a really good option for someone in this town. Like when I was growing up, I had nothing. I didn't even know that there was this book called The Illusion of Life, and it's like the Bible of animation. And it still applies. Um, and it's, in, it's back in print again. Um, if you have nothing else, I would just say you, if you buy that book, you're going to understand a lot about what animation is. And you should be able to apply it if you practice those things. Because it, it's, it's the Disney animators that created that book mm -hmm. as a way of passing the information along to the next generation. Um, One more quick question. Sorry. Sorry. Just for younger, younger students. Do you have any apps or anything that. Uh, um, that I would have, I would swing them more to like just the pure flipbook stuff of like make flipbooks and have them teach them to understand what it means to have one image move. To another image and what happens when you flip them you're creating the illusion of motion and there's a magic to that that when kids get it it's really exciting great thanks sure amber hi um hi. thank you so much sure uh, i just have a couple questions at first would you put gaming sort of animation into that same trend one i mean the gaming yeah. industry seems to be just like going it has off. and um there's just as much um artistry and incredible creativity going on in the gaming world as there is in the filmmaking. Um, Santa Monica has really become one of the great centers for that. Um, and I honestly, I don't know much about the gaming industry. I've been sort of <coughs> towards just the pure storytelling and directing end of it, but um, I've noticed that in particular, like if you can if you can draw and you can paint and you can design characters, and if you can visualize ideas very convincingly, you're gonna get work. You're gonna get a lot of work. And um, that's maybe something I should have probably put together was like an array of all the different portfolios that I see from artists and what I find valuable and what I don't, and, and who I'm just drawn to instantly and the way I would wanna use them and why. Um, I think that would be a really valuable thing for mm -hmm. me to show potential, to show students coming out of class, coming out of school and, and also maybe someone else's idea of what is valuable, someone in the gaming industry, um, because they have different concerns. Um, like there's, there's a whole set of artists that do extremely photorealistic stuff. Like there's one guy that he would, he did, he did a bunch of paintings for us, but he's the kind of guy that would design all the interior spaces for that crazy aircraft carrier ship in the Avengers. All these like super high-tech rooms with like glass panel displays and stuff. 
and he can do that. So when you when you look at that painting, you're like, yes, I believe it's there and it's all real. Let's make this movie. Like that, that's that stuff is really valuable. Um, but then there's also another side of it that's more whimsical and stylized, and that that can be really valuable as well. Um, so if you look at those making of books, the art of books that Disney puts out for their films, um, that really shows you the kind of part of the process um, of what is visualized and how it ends up in the final product. Mm -hmm. I just have one other quick question. It's not quite related, but um, I'm a remote worker. I've been for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's part of the presentation of Jane X. So I'm just going to tap in for a little information here. Is there an opportunity that you see um, within your industry? Do they ever break off sort of special projects and throw them off somewhere to just get your damn work done? We're going to post you out here somewhere to do this part of a movie um, together? Or I guess conversely, is there a way that you would see um, a region being able to be attractive, either to singular remote workers or special teams? Well, if the cost of living is low, I mean, I think artists can be poor. <laughs> often they, can be poor. <laughs> they definitely can be poor. And um, having a, like a low cost place to live that when they want to do a project is there's a track that's attractive. Um, but the other s thing that you're reminding me of is the, the off site, which is typically this would be like a winery in Sonoma or something mm -hmm. where you you take all your writers and directors and producers and you send them to this place to go figure out a problem and to do that story process, but do it away from, that's, that's the whole thing about, that I was getting back to about bringing the romance back to the process is people want to be thrown out of their normal day-to-day -day lives and be brought to a place that kind of jogs their sense of creativity and imagination and um, this is a place that definitely can do that and it seems like you have the capabilities to do it with the quality of the hotel is like a huge thing right there. If the hotel was really like falling apart and didn't have Wi-Fi and like there's there's hotels even in California when I was getting married that um, we had this like emergency venue shift and there's this one very large hotel that didn't have any online reservation capability at all. And in that case it worked out because suddenly we discovered that no one else had discovered it. So we could use it, but for <laughs> <laughs> but and it was fine. But they were trapped in the 20th century, you know. And if you want to be like the, the way that this hotel is operating, where you can call, they they do an international transaction. Everything is like very easily figured out. That's like a main like if you want to plant your flag to do an offsite, you need that hotel to work properly in this hotel fits in that category easily. Um, is in terms of like places to do that work, um, I didn't really get a good look at where Jeremy has his music shop, but I could think of a building like that as working, could possibly work really well, you know, if it had like larger spaces that were comfortable. We're planning on this place could work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's so close. You know? Yeah. It's right down the street. Break for lunch, you know, it becomes a place where you do your work and it's also charming. the fire hub. Oh, oh, is it? Yeah. Well, there you go. And it's courtyard. And it's not seasonal dependent. Right. Yeah, exactly. Snow is, in fact, uh, you you work your socks off for five days and then we'll helicopter you. It takes 10 minutes and take you to a summit. ridiculous lodge. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> talk summit, right? Yeah. And you can see 50, 60,000 vertical feet best powder in the world, or just sit and stare at others doing it, sipping wine, and, <laughs> and wondering how you got so lucky. Awesome. Uh, that's what happens that. from here. And the food's always really good. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what, what is that place? There's, there are five or six. Oh, yeah, right. Right. It's all, all part of the animation summit. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> uh, well, one more question, or should we... Anything, folks? Anything? Yeah. I, just, I'm from 70 Mile House, and, and I'll, I don't think it's quite as scenic as this, <laughs> but I love it. Um, <laughs> and we had a, um, anim, an animator, a, mm -hmm. a cartoonist, or what, whatever he did, 
and he worked online and um, all of that. He also uh, did art lessons in our community mm -hmm. and taught um, some very challenged youth. Mm -hmm. um, and gave, gave them art lessons and it, what a wonderful gift he was to our community while he yeah. was there and he sadly moved away and we miss him deeply and just that one person made such a difference in our community. Yeah, I, I think the kids that, especially in, in my own children, they're, they're in a classroom and they don't even understand why they're stuck in this place all day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really make sense for them. But I think when you show them art and music and just other ways of learning about the world, and I think it, as a kid, when, when I got into art class, suddenly my whole like sense of creativity and what it meant to be a person and what validated you, the way, you know, using your imagination in a new way, and that grown-ups were saying, it's okay to do this, go, draw, run, make music, make art. and. Um, that was tremendously empowering to me um, because otherwise I'd just be like staring at like doing quadratic equations and wondering like how am I going to use this and, um, and some people do use it some people have like engineering brains and they they apply that knowledge beautifully but I, I think there's other avenues for kids and if you just show them a little of, of that then they can capitalize on that and just run with it and become great people so so let's do that. Hey John, for everybody, sorry, I'm going to just sneak in one quick question. Because um, I'm, I'm pretending to take notes for your session, but I forgot to bring a pen, so I'm just remembering everything you said. <laughs> and the final thing, it's an excellent question, it says, where can people go for more information? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had the, the pleasure to actually get to know you on a first name basis, so, mm -hmm. I mean, can we pick on you in the future if people want to ask, are you available for questions in the future? Or sure. Can we try and use you as our guy whose face we know is a resource? Sure, I mean, okay. I mean, in some ways I'm probably not even the best person, like I can't answer those technical questions the way I wish I could. But you're the but guy I can understand. Castle. Yeah, <laughs> but I can understand, you know, the animation mentor question I'm better equipped to handle. So I, you know, yeah, so if I can't answer question is, are you well, open to be, to be a person that people in this room and who've come to the summit sure, can stay in touch with and sure. comfortable with that? Sure. Great. So would you like them to do that via an email address or yeah, it's, website? Yeah, it's John G. Cars. Go with a pen, write this down. <laughs> John G. Cars at gmail.com. Thanks. And if you forget that, you can just contact the Capsule Institute and we have John's contact. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Oops. Okay, so John, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you. Such a pleasure coming up here.